"'Stand him up!' cried the officer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. In the Penal Colony by Franz Kafka. Translated by Ian Johnston of Malaspina University College, Nanaimo, British Columbia, Canada. In the Penal Colony. It's a peculiar apparatus said the officer to the traveller, gazing with a certain admiration at the device with which he was, of course, thoroughly familiar. It appeared that the traveller had responded to the invitation of the commandant only out of politeness when he had been invited to attend the execution of a soldier, condemned for disobeying and insulting his superior. Of course, interest in the execution was not very high, not even in the penal colony itself. At least, here in the small, deep, sandy valley, closed in on all sides by barren slopes, apart from the officer and the traveller, there were present only the condemned, a vacant-looking man with a broad mouth and dilapidated hair and face, and the soldier, who held the heavy chain to which were connected the small chains which bound the condemned man by his feet and wrist-bones, as well as by his neck and which were also linked to each other by connecting chains. The condemned man had an expression of such dog-like resignation that it looked as if one could set him free to roam around the slopes, and would only have to whistle at the start of the execution for him to return. The traveller had little interest in the apparatus, and walked back and forth behind the condemned man, almost visibly indifferent while the officer took care of the final preparations. Sometimes he crawled under the apparatus, which was built deep into the earth, and sometimes he climbed up a ladder to inspect the upper parts. These were really jobs which could have been left to a mechanic, but the officer carried them out with great enthusiasm, maybe because he was particularly fond of this apparatus, or maybe because there was some other reason why one could not trust the work to anyone else. It's all ready now, he finally cried, and climbed back down the ladder. He was unusually tired, breathing with his mouth wide open. Now, have a look at this apparatus, he added immediately, drying his hands with a towel and pointing to the device. Up to this point I had to do some work by hand, but from now on the apparatus should work entirely on its own. The traveller nodded and followed the officer. The latter tried to protect himself against all eventualities by saying, Of course, breakdowns do happen. I really hope none will occur today, but we must be prepared for it. The apparatus is supposed to keep going for twelve hours without interruption, but if any breakdowns do occur, they'll only be very minor, and we'll deal with them right away. This apparatus, he said, grasping a connecting rod and leaning against it, is our previous commandant's invention. I also worked with him on the very first tests, and took part in all the work right up to its completion. However, the credit for the invention belongs to him alone. Have you heard of our previous commandant? No? Well, I'm not claiming too much when I say that the organization of the entire penal colony is his work, and the administration of the colony was so self-contained that even if his successor had a thousand new plans in mind, he would not be able to alter anything of the old plan, at least not for several years, and our prediction has held, and his apparatus stands here in front of us. As you see, it consists of three parts. The one underneath is called the integrated tray converter and caster cart. The upper one is called rigid captive trays, the blue output trays, or RCTs, and are located on two levels and two sides of the sorter. And here in the middle, this moving part is called the harrow. The harrow? the traveller asked. He had not been listening with full attention. The sun was excessively strong, trapped in the shadowless valley, and one could hardly collect one's thoughts. So the officer appeared to him all the more admirable in his tight tunic, weighed down with epaulettes and festooned with braid, ready to go on parade, as he explained the matter so eagerly, and while he was talking adjusted screws here and there with a screwdriver. Yes, the harrow said the officer. 
The name fits. The needles are arranged as in a harrow, and the whole thing is driven like a harrow, although it stays in one place and is in principle much more artistic. You'll understand in a moment. The condemned is laid out here on the bed. First I'll describe the apparatus, and only then let the procedure go to work. That way you'll be able to follow it better. As the needle tips touched him, a shudder went over his skin. While the soldier was busy with the right hand, the condemned man stretched out his left, with no sense of its direction, but it was pointing to where the traveller was standing. The officer kept looking at the traveller from the side without taking his eyes off him, as if he was trying to read from his face the impression he was getting of the execution, which he had now explained to him, at least superficially. The traveller looked at the harrow with a wrinkled frown. The information about the judicial procedures had not satisfied him. However, he had to tell himself that here it was a matter of a penal colony, that in this place special regulations were necessary, and that one had to give precedence to military measures right down to the last detail. Beyond that, however, he had some hopes in the new commandant, who obviously, although slowly, was intending to introduce a new procedure which the limited understanding of this officer could not cope with. The traveller stood slowly, moved up, and bent over the harrow. You see, the officer said, two sorts of needles in a multiple arrangement. Each long needle has a short one next to it. The long one inscribes, and the short one squirts water out to wash away the blood and keep the inscription always clear. The bloody water is then channelled here in small grooves and finally flows into these main gutters and the outlet pipe takes it to the pit. The officer pointed with his finger to the exact path which the bloody water had to take. As he began to demonstrate with both hands at the mouth of the outlet pipe, in order to make his account as clear as possible, the traveller raised his head and, feeling behind him with his hand, wanted to return to his chair. Hello, I'm Scott Wimmer. I'm proud to say this year I drove the number 66 Team Bruco brought to you by the United States Postal Service at the Bush Series race in Richmond, Virginia. In the penal colony, where the man, as I have mentioned, first lies face down, is this small protruding lump of felt, which can easily be adjusted so that it presses right into the man's mouth. Its purpose is to prevent him screaming and biting his tongue to pieces. Of course the man has to let the felt in his mouth, otherwise the straps around his throat would break his neck. Stand him up, cried the officer. For the first six hours the condemned man goes on living almost as before. He suffers nothing but pain. The traveller wanted to raise various questions, but after looking at the condemned man he merely asked, Does he know his sentence? No, said the officer. He wished to get on with his explanation right away. But the traveller interrupted him. He doesn't know his own sentence. No, said the officer once more. He then paused for a moment, as if he was asking the traveller for a more detailed reason for his question, and said, It would be useless to give him that information. He experiences it on his own body. The traveller really wanted to keep quiet at this point, but he felt how the condemned man was gazing at him. He seemed to be asking whether he could approve of the process the officer had described. So the traveller, who had up to this point been leaning back, bent forward again, and kept up his questions. But does he nonetheless have some general idea that he's been condemned? Not that either, said the officer, and he smiled at the traveller as if he was still waiting for some strange revelations from him. I don't know, the officer said, whether the commandant has already explained the apparatus to you. The traveller made a vague gesture with his hand. Postmaster General discussed this morning. There, we are making 
uh, technological investments that we think will add value to the mail, intelligent mail barcode being the, the best example of that. Anyway, there in the inscriber is the mechanism which determines the movement of the harrow, and this mechanism is arranged according to the diagram on which the centers is set down. I still use the diagrams of the previous commandant. Here they are. He pulled some pages out of the leather folder. Unfortunately, I can't hand them to you. They are the most cherished thing I possess. Sit down, and I'll show you them from this distance. Then you'll be able to see it all well. He showed the first sheet. The traveller would have been happy to say something appreciative, but all he saw was a labyrinthine series of lines, crisscrossing each other in all sorts of ways. These covered the paper so thickly that only with difficulty could one make out the white spaces in between. Read it, said the officer. I can't, said the traveller. But it's clear, said the officer. It's very elaborate, said the traveller evasively, but I can't decipher it. Yes, said the officer, smiling, and putting the folder back again. It's not calligraphy for schoolchildren. One has to read it a long time. You too will finally understand it clearly. Of course, it has to be a script that isn't simple. You see, it's not supposed to kill right away, but on average over a period of... Anyway, and then the execution began. No discordant note disturbed the work of the machine. Many people did not look any more at all, but lay down with closed eyes in the sand. They all knew. Now justice was being carried out. In silence people listened to nothing but the groans of the condemned man, muffled by the felt. These days the machine no longer manages to squeeze a strong groan out of the condemned man, something the felt is not capable of smothering. But back then the needles which made the inscription dripped a caustic liquid, which we're not permitted to use any more today. Well, then came the sixth hour. It was impossible to grant all the requests people made to be allowed to watch from up close. The commandant, in his wisdom, arranged that the children should be taken care of before all the rest. Naturally, I was always allowed to stand close by because of my official position. Often I crouched down there with two small children in my arms, on my right and left. So now the man is lying down, said the traveller. He leaned back in his chair and crossed his legs. Yes, said the officer, pushing his cap back a little and running his hand over his hot face. Now, listen, 